Hello, this is Melissa, and it is the 28th of January, 2024. And I hope that you're all doing well. I wanted to mention a few things off the bat. First, thank you very much for those of you who donated and ordered. And this was a very big help to me. I did not make my goal. I did end up having to put some of my property taxes on a credit card, but much better that it was only a portion because I don't have the credit to pay my taxes. So this was helpful. I now have a year to prepare for the next huge bill, and I can take my beggar's tin can away for a while, but I do ask that those of you who like what I'm doing that you continue to support. I also wanted to briefly mention the Carol Quigley Tragedy and Hope Book Club. The Cutting Through the Matrix Book Club on Telegram has its channel started now. You'll find interaction going on there, comments and bits that have been posted. That is https colon forward slash forward slash t dot m e forward slash cutting through the matrix book club and I will put that link up and encourage those of you who want to participate to go and sign up for telegram and subscribe to that channel it is interesting uh, Darren and I will be recording our first conversation about the first segment tomorrow on Monday and we haven't heard from anybody that wanted to participate actively in that conversation with us, but we will post the conversation in various segments uh, in full in some places. You'll see it on the website, of course, and other channels, but do check out the Telegram Cutting Through the Matrix book club so that you can participate. And thank you for all the email. Also, really quickly, I want to say that I have begun to figure out. I'm working my way towards a little better system for working. Uh, how to respond more quickly to emails. And I don't want people to stop emailing because I am far behind, because the communication is essential. The things that you say, your lives, the news that you share with me. So I have made a promise that over the next couple of weeks, I will catch up if you haven't heard from me yet, you will and soon. And so thank you for that, for continuing to write. There's a shamanic priestess from the Amazon who had done some kind of ritual blowing into her hands and then onto the foreheads of the director of the IMF and the president of the World Bank and a millionaire and a CEO and... Uh, you know, so invoking some kind of spirit and we can join our hands before performing the shamanic rite, the chief just said. We can join our hands, unite our hearts, unite our thoughts in the same direction for the healing of the planet and spiritual healing while assuring that when we unite in our thinking and our heart, our Mother Earth will listen to us. And the Catholic priest said, what Spirit governs Davos. On the Texas border, there is some action going on right now because the Supreme Court has agreed that the federal government can cut the razor wire that the state has put up to keep migrants from flooding in. And they call this razor wire to be cruel and so that is in the court right now, but they, that's where it is right now, as they're saying the federal government can do this, whereas the governor of Texas has said, he issued a statement a couple of days ago, asserting Texas' constitutional right to self-defense as tensions with the Biden administration over security escalated. Governor Abbott interpreted the U.S. Constitution, he gives the article, section, and clause as granting Texas the authority to act autonomously against an invasion due to federal inaction. 
So, meanwhile, there is a group of people who are calling themselves God's army. A convoy calling themselves God's army plans to head to the Texas border to stop migrants from entering the U.S. They say they've been chosen by God for this moment. We are besieged on all sides by dark forces of evil. So there's a lot of um, heavy religious rhetoric there as they head down to the border. And Putin's ally... Dmitry Medvedev, the former Russian president and ally of current Russian president Vladimir Putin, made an ominous comment on Friday about Texas potentially starting a new civil war in the United States. Medvedev, who currently serves as the deputy chair of Russia's Security Council, released a lengthy statement on X reiterating his past prediction that Texas would secede from the rest of the U.S., something the state has no legal ability to do and potentially kickstart a civil war. So over the years, there has been a lot of secessionist talk around Texas, and currently they refer to people who have that aim in mind as Texits, like Brexit. But I can tell you that from what I've seen of government corruption in this state, if they seceded from the federal government, it's really just a little microcosm of the mess that is the federal government here. While looking into that, though, I did see a story that kind of tied into other things that I was looking at. Paul Craig Roberts wrote a, a good piece on the end of nationality, and he talks about what makes a nation, and he, he said that in the U.S. it was an exception. He said ethnicity is the basis of countries. Germany consisted of Germanic people and the Germanic language and the German culture. Same for France, same for England, same for the Dutch, etc. But the U.S. was the exception. This was the place where peoples were to be assimilated and then become American. But this process, which had been tried and true, was abandoned in 1965 when the gates were opened to large-scale non-European immigration. Shortly thereafter, the flood of illegal immigration joined the infusions of alien populations into the U.S. With the ethnic basis of America in decline, multiculturalism became the new value and took the place of assimilation. There is a difference there. The idea of assimilation was always that melting pot. People come to the United States and they assimilate. They take on the values of this country. Multiculturalism is retaining the values of the country of origin. And it's an unworkable situation. When I was looking at Paul Craig Roberts' article on nationality, I saw something else that he had just put up last week called Sodom and Gomorrah is being imposed on citizens by allegedly representative governments. And he goes on to talk about a variety of stories, such as the Methodist Church of Great Britain has labeled the terms husband and wife offensive, uh, this is not the reality for many people. We want a designation, parent number one, parent number two. Uh, California wants every large retail store to include gender-neutral toy sections or face fines and other punishments. There was a teacher in California who was fired. Um, at the time, it said that he was suspended, but I think he has subsequently been fired because he did not want male students who identified as female to strip naked in front of young girls. And for standing up for that position, he lost his job. I will put that up. This Paul Craig Roberts is coming from a, a longer article on global research out of Canada, and it's worth looking into. There is also a story, it's an odd one, the way that it's written, but when you get to the end of it and you think about what you've read, it's just a piece of incredibly clever propaganda. 
And I'm going to summarize it for you instead of reading the whole thing. But basically, it is a story of a mother who tells about fleeing the state of Texas with her family, all their possessions and two cars, because they had to seek emergency urgent care for a 12-year-old transgender daughter who was crying over pain in her ear. So the way that the story starts off is that transgender children cannot get health care in the state of Texas, so they're fleeing. Fleeing because of an earache is really how, you know, what the story sounds like at the beginning. But then you go on to read it, and you discover that what it, the reaction is actually to Senate Bill 14 that bars Texas health care providers from giving gender transition surgeries, puberty-blocking medication or hormone therapies to those under 18, violators at risk of losing their licenses. Measures like it have been pushed in recent years, along with a record number of anti-LGBTQ bills across the U.S. states, largely by Republicans, including some who've argued bans on such care protect against, quote, irreversible, end quote, biological changes facilitated by parents. Then it goes on to say that many medical institutions consider these kinds of care, if you want to call it care, these surgeries and the hormones as being safe and effective and in some cases life-saving. But that paragraph has the word irreversible in quotations as if it's some kind of crazy crank idea when in fact Gender transition surgeries are indeed irreversible. This is, besides great harm to children and bodily mutilation, it is a form of eugenics. And children who have puberty-blocking drugs, which they decry as not at all child abuse. The parents who wish to do this, of course, you know, want to defend themselves. They are not abusing their children. This is something safe and effective and potentially life-saving. It reminded me of something that Alan covered in this talk when he read the, that there was a book that was up for sale this was, he was reading it on November the 11th, 2010, entitled The Pedophile's Guide to Love and Pleasure, A Child Lover's Code of Conduct. And Amazon defended keeping it up there. They said Amazon believes it is censorship not to sell certain books simply because we or others believe their message is objectionable. Amazon does not support or promote hatred or criminal acts. However, we do support the right of every individual to make their own purchasing decisions. And it just made me think that whenever it is decided that pedophilia is to be no longer fringe, no longer intergenerational sex, but a natural and normal relationship, it will be, and we will have relentless, constant articles that tell us that it is a safe and effective kind of relationship and potentially life-affirming, and that anyone who says otherwise endangers the lives of the children. This is how it's done. It's slow at first, it's over decades, and then boom, all of a sudden, there it is. In this talk from November 11, 2010, Allen's poem, Those Who Guide Fate End the Nation State, Van Rompuy Lennon, Gloating with Hate, Proudly Announced End of the Nation State, Mission Accomplished Pleasing His Masters Who Own the EU, 
bringer of disasters, suit and tie revolutionaries, socialist lovers, screwed whole peoples under the covers of pretenses and lies of just free trade as they gobbled in taxes what people got paid. For years, these commissars worked undetected. Media gave cover so no one suspected. Amalgamation was always the destination. Leaders signed closer ties binding each nation. He who caught on was branded the fool, suffering haughty sneers and much ridicule. The world is a stage. Politicos are actors, plying deception to hide any truth factors. And another body that Alan mentioned in this talk was the OECD. The OECD is the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, an intergovernmental organization with 38 member countries, founded in 1961 to stimulate economic progress and world trade. Now, I looked into this a little bit, and the OECD came out of the Organization for European Economic Cooperation, the OEEC, which was established in 1948 to help administer the Marshall Plan that had been rejected by both the Soviet Union and its satellite states. So this was part of the reconstruction of Europe, but when it was deemed that it was no longer a useful organization, this OECD sprang up. And the OECD is an official United Nations observer. But recently, the United Nations, had, just in the last week or so, has more or less come out and said that the OECD has no longer any right to be uh, setting policy on tax collection. UN calls for end to OECD control of global tax policy. The United Nations is wrestling with the OECD for global control over how new rules will be constructed to regulate the formation of a new corporate tax policy. Human rights investigators at the United Nations have warned the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development that their controversial global minimum tax plan risks violating human rights. So what it is, is which body is going to control taxation. And so that is in the news again. And finally, finally, the United Nations once again, their International Court of Justice made an interim judgment saying that Israel must take measures to prevent genocide in Gaza, but it stopped short of ordering an immediate ceasefire in Israel's war with Hamas. So this was what they call a landmark case brought by South Africa against Israel. And the International Court of Justice rejected Israel's request for the case to be dismissed. And, of course, Netanyahu said this is outrageous, this is ridiculous, Israel is not committing genocide. Israeli leaders have insisted that the country is acting within its rights to self-defense. But what is interesting here is that going on nearly 26,000 people, 26,000 Palestinians. There's the initial 1,200 Israelis and what they claim is the kidnapping of 240 others and what they say is the fact that 100 are still being held hostage. Where they are could possibly be safely held hostage, we don't know since that area has been bombed into rubble. And Neil sent me something, Neil Foster sent me something, which I don't have up in front of me, but I will put that link up there to do with Israel's policy of non-negotiation on hostages. So where are we really? What really is at stake here? But what is sad is this is just an interim judgment. We're told this is a, you know, of utmost concern 
that genocidal acts not be perpetrated against the Palestinians. But interim is meanwhile, meanwhile it carries on. Well, other than the fact that last month Canada's Prime Minister Trudeau made sure that all Parliament buildings and quite a few other government um, buildings that are funded by taxpayers have tampons and material for the menstrual cycle available for their trans staffers. Justin Trudeau announces plans to install taxpayer-funded free tampon dispensers in Parliament buildings' men's bathrooms for trans staffers. So this will affect all of the government toilet rooms, including, I'm trying to scroll down here and find, all federal public service departments, crown corporations, banks, airports, and train yards. You will find women's feminine hygiene supplies in men's bathrooms. So you couldn't possibly make this up. But this is where we are worldwide. And the last article that I want to bring to your attention is very sad. I will not read it in full. But this is from LifeSite News. Austrian doctor ordered to pay parents for failing to spot disability of a baby they would have aborted. An Austrian doctor has been ordered to pay more than 70,000 euros because he conducted several ultrasounds and did not see that this couple's girl was missing an arm. The baby was born Without the limb, the parents said had they known, they would have aborted. And this, the article goes on with people weighing in, particularly from the Catholic Laity Council of Austria. But there are very good comments that are being made. I just want to remind you that eugenics deciding who lives and who dies is something that plays out in front of us in very many different ways. So if something is injected into your body that is heritable, that harms the following generation, that affects uh, fertility, or if children are given so-called gender-affirming surgeries and puberty-blocking hormones. This is a form of eugenics. This decides, ultimately, who lives and who dies. And the president of the Catholic laity of Austria said, It is, therefore, incomprehensible that the inhuman diction that a child can constitute a case of damage continues to be used. A society that views the abortion of disabled children as lawful is knowingly allowing a continuous threat to humanity. So I'll leave you now with Alan's talk from November the 11th, 2010, the end of the nation state and a lot of other topics that he covers. And I wish you all a good week, and thank you again for your support. Hi folks, I'm Alan Watson. This is Cutting Through the Matrix on November the 11th, 2010. For newcomers to the show, and I get letters all the time from people who've just listened in, so youngsters are always tuning into the show to find out what's happening. You should look into cuttingthroughthematrix.com and you'll find hundreds of talks you can go over at your leisure where I try to give you shortcuts to the big picture of this crazy bewildering system into which you're born. It's not so crazy after all, because it's really planned. Your whole existence is planned, your future is planned, and the time you're born into, everything that happens in it is planned as well on the big scale, on a global scale, because, we, yeah, we do have world planners. We've had them for an, an awful long time, and they do 
make all the big changes across the world happen on cue when it's time to go into the next phase. That's why you're having the wars in the Middle East and a few other places. The last few places to, to clean up, mop up, standardize into the world global democratic system, as I like to call it, and stick in a, a world bank or a central bank system under the World Bank and uh, get them under the thumb and then start taxing the blazes out of them to distribute the wealth across the world. So let's tell us anyway. I wonder where it really all goes. So help yourself to the audios, and while you're at it too, remind, remind yourself that uh, you can buy the books and discs I have for sale to keep me going. And that's all I ask, really, is just uh, to to trickle over and from show to show. So buy these books are different from anything else you'll read. It's, it's not the usual who done it sort of stuff and his stories, which is history. Uh, it's to do with the techniques of controlling populations down through time to the present time. And I do also give you the big foundations, which are all linked together today across the world, pushing their global agenda. A very definite fixed agenda. They know exactly where they're going, what kind of society they want, and is step by step towards it. And the changing of all cultures into this big mush. Out of it will come chaos, and out of that will come a new order of things, their ideal uh, placid society where they've uh, genetically modified everyone who cause a problem, basically. And that's what it's all really about. It's been happening for a long time. We're already affected by it, and everyone's been kind of bioengineered to some extent through the chemicals, inoculations, and even the GMO food they've been feeding you. So that's the big nasty story that you're living in. Some people can't take that. They prefer to live in a bubble, or they jump into the new age looking for some spiritual way to escape it all. And uh, there's always there's lots of um, uh, organizations you can join for whichever religion or branch of it you want to choose. There's a big shopping mall out there called Religious Shopping Mall, and it's all supplied for you. And you'll find similar people of your own ilk in the particular one you choose. And you can always change, remember, the fashion as you wish and try something different, all supplied by the ones at the top who understand how humans tick. And remember, from the U.S. to Canada, you can buy the materials that I I sell with a personal check to Canada or an international postal money order to Canada. You can use the donation button and send a separate email with your name, your address, and order, and I'll get it right out to you as fast as I can. The same across the rest of the world. Remember, and you can also use MoneyGram, which is cheaper than Western Union. And if you can really afford Western Union, then go ahead and wire it across. It's up to you. Some people to send cash, and that's acceptable too at the present. And who knows what the future will bring, because the big banks are making big concerted moves together. And um, things have to go, to go cashless eventually within four years, apparently, from all the news blurbs that have been out over the last two or three years. That's with three or four years left, I suppose, before uh, paper money and so on will be phased out altogether. Then they can really track you back with more after these messages. Hi folks, I'm back and we're cutting through the matrix. As I say, it's a big system into which you're born. Everyone's born into the same system. It's slightly varied for different countries, of course, at least it was in the past. Most countries are catching up because they all watch the same television movies and uh, made in Hollywood. Back in the 70s and early, and even the late 60s, the Council on Foreign Relations said eventually you'll have a transatlantic culture and then they a pan-American culture, really pan-LA, basically, because Hollywood would create the culture for the world for the rest to follow. And they're quite right, it's already happened. You'll see the same baggy pants and so on, and uh, the way of dressing that you'll see in America, across even Africa and different places. Everyone emulates what they see, and that's all intentional. Uh, it's even mentioned in one of the articles I meant about, I read a while back uh, from uh, an American military magazine where they talked about ongoing wars, perpetual wars, and how they would put a degraded culture across the world because it really breaks them down. It breaks down societies, it breaks down resistance to integration of the global system. And they did call it in the article uh, degraded culture. And that's what we have today. We're conquered, actually. When you've got degraded con- a culture, you're conquered. You can't stand up for anything in moral relativity, and that's what you've been taught for an awful long time. I've also gone through the history of the economic union of uh, Europe that was to be the first amalgamation of a continent, basically, um, put out by Karl Marx 
in the 1800s initially. He talked about uh, trading blocks, there'd be amalgamations where countries would be basically submerged into these systems and they would lose their sovereignty altogether. And the first one was to be the European uh, integration, and that's what's happened. We've lived through it, many of us have lived through the integration. We live through all the lies and deceit. As I said, every country will keep its sovereignty and it'll be a sort of debating place where they agree upon prices and imports and exports. Nonsense. It was meant to get a parliament up and going, which they set up in Brussels, of course. And eventually, once they set it up and had it all running, they admitted to the public and actually released their documents that said in 1948, when they set it up, that the, the public were never to be told the true uh, purpose of this economic union. Uh, because uh, they wouldn't go for it, they wouldn't give up their sovereignty. So they lied, 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 because that's the system you're really living in. Big agendas for the world. The America has to follow suit, and Canada has signed agreements with the U.S., Mexico, and other ones too. Chile was another one uh, to integrate the Americas. And don't forget too, as far back as 1912, I think it was, uh, a, a big building was set up in Washington D.C for the amalgamation of the Americas. It's called the America House. And it was, they meant total integration of the Americas. Massive, um, very expensive building. And you can look it up on the Internet for yourself. And we have all these big organizations, foundations, pushing, pushing, pushing for integration. In fact, the Council of Foreign Relations came out in 2005 with the ex-Vice uh, Prime Minister of Canada, uh, Mr. I think it was Axworthy at the time, uh, leading the CFR for the Americas under their own banner of the CFR for the first time on national television Canada, uh, saying that they were signing the integration for the Americas, and it had to be so, and they had to eventually amalgamate and compete with Europe, then China. Well, wow, eh? China, can you compete with China? No, of course you can't. It's a ridiculous idea. That's not the intention, of course. It's to bring you down into poverty and share what they call your wealth to the rest of the world, which, of course, is the big corporations which they set up across the rest of the world, not to any peoples. Anyway, this great tyranny, this new Soviet, that's what it is, because the CFR, where the big boys, too, were all behind the Soviet Union under the Royal Institute of International Affairs, their their British companion, who set up that and funded it via their bankers that comprised the setting up of the Milner Group and the Royal Institute of International Affairs, all international bankers and their sons. They were the big players and agents who travelled the world uh, amalgamating and amalgamating and make sure the funding was getting to the right places for revolutions and money was getting to the right places too to keep revolutions going once they'd started. And that's in the history of tragedy and hope, by the way, by the historian for the CFR, uh, Carl Quigley, for those who want to wade through it. And you've got to also read um, the Anglo-American establishment where he goes into this group. Who, who said, he said, we're, we're always blamed or, or thought of as being sort of communist, he says, but uh, the reason that that is because they push the exact same system as communism. That's why you have a Sovietized European Union. And here's just something to augment what I've said, and this is this article that came out today from uh, uh, the chief, the head, Honcho, the big dictator of the new Soviet of the EU, uh, Mr. Rompuy, uh, who was never elected. I read the article two weeks ago, I think, where he he came out in an outburst replying to something, some accusations, and he said he was elected in secret, he said. (laughs) That was in the national papers. That's how open this great democracy of the EU is. It's a dictatorship. Just like Lenin's dictatorship over the proletariat. So he says this, nation states are dead. There should be a warning to everybody in America and Canada and everywhere else. I don't think it'll do much, mind you, because we're really already integrated. We've signed five, five agreements so far for integration annually since 2005. They kept quiet about this one in Canada this year. But it says here, the age of the nation state is over and the idea that countries can stand alone is an illusion and a lie the EU president believes, he says. So the age of the nation state is over. That's the death knell for it. 
This is in one of the most open proclamations of the goals of a European superstate since the heyday of Jacques Delors, Hermann von Rompuy Lenin, so I added the last part there, went on to denounce Euroscepticism as the greatest threat to peace. Now, I'm not kidding you when I say Leninism here, because, you see, it's run on, on the socialistic principles of the Soviet you do what you're told, you can't uh, question them, the, the, the top boys are, are all, all meeting secret, we don't even know who they are. It's not run like any parliament or democracy or even republic that we know. Except perhaps China, it's closer to China system. And he says here, Euroscepticism is the greatest threat to peace. That's exactly what Lenin would have said about counter-revolutionaries, those who were against it. We don't know what happened to them, don't we? And I'm not kidding about that either. This is getting to that stage where these characters are going to be utterly ruthless. They've already said it was heresy to question the European Union, or what it does even, and how it operates. Anyway, it says conservative backbenchers condemned the inflammatory comments in the speech made by Van Rompuy to mark the 21st anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall. They said it proved that David Cameron, that's this front man they've got in Britain right now, that pretends he's conservative, would have a battle on his hands if he's to prevent extra powers being handed to Brussels. They'll just take it, they'll sign everything that else they've been asked to sign. Last night, 23 conservative members of parliament, including former leadership contender David Davis, rebelled in the Commons by demanding a referendum if the, Lyndon treat, uh, the Lisbon Treaty is amended, even if ministers argue that changes do not affect the UK. And their call was defeated. So Mr. Van Rompuy's speech in the German capital told his audience that the time of the homogenous nation state is over. There you go, just like that, that's all over. He added that the danger of Euroscepticism was spreading far beyond the confines of countries such as Britain and was becoming a stronger force across the whole continent. It says we have to, to <laughs> we have to together to fight the danger of a new Euroscepticism. He declared there's no longer the monopoly of a few countries, and it means at stake basically. And they're trying to say this great thing is is going to how it's going to be how they survive. Now they've already been flattened with this de- this man-made depression that was that uh, exploded on cue when somebody pushed the plunger, uh, because that's how they do things in the real world. Nothing happens by chance. Believe you me, nothing happens by chance on a big scale. And then they'll, they'll have to bail each other out, supposedly, and uh, the bankers win, win, win. And remember, too, as I say, the Royal Institute of International Affairs was begun and controlled, still is, by bankers at the top. International lenders, really. That's what they do. And they already have their, their, their department for the whole of the EU Parliament. They become members of the European Institute for International Affairs, but still answerable to London. I mean, talking about the city. So, this Belgian equated the Euroscepticism with fear, which eventually leads to war, he says, echoing former President Francois Mitterrand's famous phrase that nationalism is war. Really? Well, what does he think that internationalism is? Hmm? What was the Cold War about? Internationalism. Hmm? Uh, and who was Mitterrand anyway to speak? Because this is the guy who literally thought he was a descendant. He was descended, he thought, uh, from Pharaoh, one of the Pharaohs, through his many reincarnations. This is the guy who had all that Masonic uh, regalia on uh, under the guards with the arch and the whole bit with their swords in front of the, the new museum they made, that pyramid they made. It would be a big, big show of that. But of course, very importantly, like Peter Trudeau and others, he had a single red rose on his coffin a sign of international socialism when he died. Anyway, today's nationalism is often not a positive feeling of pride in one's own identity, but a negative feeling of apprehension of the others. So they're going to say you're, you've got homophobic now, which means fear of homosexuals, which is kind of strange. You're not fear of them. You're not allowed to dislike people. And you're not allowed to dislike other, other people's as well. You don't even have to even like your own people, if you have any. But the fact is, they're calling everything phobic, you see. So today's nationalism is a kind of phobia, like xenophobia. And uh, it's like an illness. No, no doubt they'll have a treatment for that one day, if they don't already. Anyway, in a strong defense of the euro, he said the recession would have been far worse if France still had its franc and Germany still had its mark. I don't know how he figures that one out, because um, 
really, if countries are, are managing their own books and are not plummeting, why they should they go into debt to bail out the rest? And then they all owe money to the World Bank and international bankers. Back with more after this. Hi, folks. We're back, and we're cutting through the matrix. Just reading an article about the end of the nation state, according to Mr. Rompuy, who's the, the dictator of the new Soviet Europe. And uh, that's what he says, and that's the guy whose partner is the power and all the rest of it. And what are they going to do, do about it? What will anybody do about it? What can they do about it? Because they don't even know what's happening in the real world, do they? Most folk don't. They don't know, know that most of these prime ministers all belong to the G20, G8, and all these things, the OECD, and to distribute the wealth across the planet. They have no idea of all the clubs that these heads of state all belong to as you go along with this CFR global agenda, this trilateral CFR Royal Institute of International Affairs global agenda that was laid down before any of us were born. Any of us were born. But here it goes anyway. And they never mention any this stuff in election times. It's always pension plans and health care and the lie anyway. So Now it says here too, uh, as Eurocrats waste millions from taxes, it says... Millions of pounds of the EU funds have been squandered on projects, including a hydrotherapy centre for dogs and sending a troop around Britain to perform the smelly foot dance. Isn't that rather good? That's good culture for you. See, they destroy the old cultures and they give you smelly feet instead. Taxpayers' cash has also gone to a hip-hop laboratory in Lyon, France, to address the lack of cooperation in European hip-hop. It's a very important thing, apparently, as the as folk are losing their homes across parts of Europe and definitely in Britain. Then it says, um, the details were revealed yesterday by the think tank Open Europe, a day after auditors, now listen to this, a day after this European auditors for this big Soviet year, refused to give the EU's accounts a clean bill of health for the 16th year in a row. They don't tell you anything. It's tr- you know, they won't let you know what they're up to. Top secrecy. As it's, as it's, as it's, this is called a new and open transparent society, supposedly. I think the white man speaks with a forked tongue. They emerged a fortnight after David Cameron faced a battle with the EU Parliament over the size of his budget for 2011. The Parliament wanted an increase of 6% on this year's £88 billion. That's what it gives to the EU from Britain. But Mr Cameron seems to have persuaded other countries to join him in restricting it to 2.9%, which is nonsense because Cameron's in on all this. Anyway, Open Europe produced a list of 50 examples of EU waste. So the top of the list was the £350,000 for a dog fitness and rehabilitation centre in Hungary. The EU's Rural Development Fund paid it a huge sum for a project to improve the lifestyle and living standards of dogs, which include developments of a hydrotherapy system for the dogs. More than a year on, the building has yet to start, but someone's pocketed the money, of course, and is living on interest until it does start. Some $4.5 million went on a fleet of limousines for European members of Parliament. Naturally, it is, you know, Caesars and his bunch are always Caesars and his bunch. In Strasbourg in 2009 alone, all chauffeurs at the company must sign a confidentiality clause guaranteeing absolute discretion. So don't tell where they've taken them or the whores that they bring back, whatever description or type they happen to be. In Britain golf course, or the stuff they snort in the back seats. In Britain golf courses, motorsport centres and hunting clubs have all benefited from thousands of pounds which are meant for fam- farming subsidies for smaller farms. Well, that's them out. <laughs> Open Europe director Mats Persson said the EU's budget is irrational, overly complex and hopelessly out of date. Huge amounts of money are wasted on projects which do nothing to help the EU economy to get back on track and there should be no talk whatsoever of budget increases until the problems with waste and mismanagement are stamped out. Well, why are we abolishing the darn thing? It's, it truly is a secret society at the top of that parliament there. It really is. So that won't happen, of course, because this was planned a long, long time ago. And guys who literally will work on something in secret and lie to every country year after year that it's just an economic agreement for trade and then you end up losing your sovereignty under a super parliament exactly what Karl Marx said you know, they aren't going to sit around and discuss changes of plans at this stage of the game they're not going to do it you're under an authoritarian society now remember the Club of Rome said democracy had to go and they're the main advisors to all these groups that run everything in the world so democracy is too, too, it just takes too long to get anything done, to get the great work done. 
because there's so many competing parties and conflicting and arguments and so on, all this kind of stuff happening. So they have to bring in authoritarianism instead to get the big thing rushing ahead. That's what you're living under now. And folk, folk who've been under it since 2001, at least, uh, hopefully you've all noticed it. Most really you haven't. We think the world just evolves accidentally, accidental view of history. And things just happen willy-nilly, and there's nothing you can do about it. Now, after the, when that's happening, at the same time this is happening, and, and, and von Rompuy Lenin there is, you know, giving them the great dictatorship, the proletariat, or the Euroteria, I guess you call it, then this is happening with the G20. And it's good news, though. It's good news. It's called the Great Leap Forward. That was the term they used. Where we heard the Great Leap Forward before? Does anybody know? Do you know where that comes from? The Great Leap Forward? The G20 ushers in the Great Leap Forward on development. They mean across the world. Eh? A new global development strategy to be unveiled this week at this week's G20 summit marks a Great Leap Forward. The head of the OECD said on Thursday, Do you know they don't even tell you what the OECD is? This is how they put things across. It's like the CFR advised the president to do so and so. You think some official thing. This is a private organization, just like the United Nations, by the way. And just like the Council on Foreign Relations is a private organization that runs the world. But I'll read this article for you and spell it out and explain it to you. When I come back from this break Hi folks, I'm back and we're cutting through the matrix Just reading this great leap forward spiel uh, To do with the G20 Again, all your prime ministers and your presidents And all attend this G20 To decide to take your tax money And spread it across their big corporations across the world And they call it foreign aid and stuff like that However, it says here that uh, I like the way they write it in these like handouts. This is a handout, obviously, by one of the PR companies for the, the OECD. But um, and the OECD is overseas economic. Um, uh, it's not community. It's something depart or department. It was set up about 1940 or something to do this very job of globalizing the world by using the tax money from from the Western countries mainly and to pump it into what they claim was the poor countries. In other words, what it's going to do is decide which countries are going to bring up to first world status for a while as they bring down the first world countries to maybe second or maybe one and a half status. Because that's what's happening now, if no one's noticed. But it says here, the the group of 20 major economies plan to endorse the Seoul Development Consensus for Shared Growth. Right Now you better understand that these are legal Statements they make, it's got a declaration. You'll often see the declaration of so-and-so. That's an official legal definition of something, and it is a declaration. If there's no comeback or, or opposition to it, it goes ahead as a legal document. So they have consensus documents, uh, declaration documents, and everything else. You know, it says, which includes an emphasis on infrastructure investment as a means to attain sustainable growth in poorer countries. It says, this is really going to change the way in which we address the development, says Angel Guria, Secretary General of the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, as she told writers, reporters. Do you understand how they all have these same terms as the UN Secretary General? Have you ever wondered why? It's all one big organization with specific functions, each department specializing. He said the adoption of a multi-year action plan would be a very big deliverable uh, from the t- a, a, bit, a very big deliverable, I guess. Hmm. From the two-day G20 summit, which starts on Thursday, the blueprint identifies nine areas where action is needed to, to ease development bottlenecks, including skills training, increased access to finance, expanded investment and improvements in the physical fabric of developing countries. These are the guys, remember, that helped bring you the World Trade Organization into being, which brought in GATT, which uh, made sure that all your factories and your work would end up in China. I hope you realize that. This is the same bunch. All the guys that you think you elect as prime ministers and presidents. So it says, the great leap forward here is that there's no longer a question of aid, it's a question of development. Guria applauded the summit host South Korea for driving the new agenda, which says there's no one formula for development success, really. He said, just keep taxing, taxing the West till there's nothing left to tax. And it says... Um, 
uh, it says the, the plan to set up a high level panel to recommend ways to mobilize financing for infrastructure in developing countries. And the world, here's the World Bank in there too, this other big private company set up again by the same boys who set up the CFR and the Royal Institute for International Affairs for a world society. The World Bank President Robert Zillick estimates the financing, this is all they'll need by the way from all you lot that's listening out there, that all they'll need is, is about $900 billion per year. That's all they want, this one group. Never mind all the other billions they want for their other projects. They only want $900 billion a year from all of you out there. So his actual investment is about half of that, Zulik said in Singapore on Wednesday. And then, of course, they always bring out the other NGOs, which they all own, by the way. The foundations own the NGOs who come out playing the opposition or demanding that they keep their promises. So right after it, it's got the same thing. And it says the Overseas Development Institute, a British think tank. So he's a private think tank again, right, who works for the World Bank. So the G20's emphasis on trade, investment and growth was the right one for long-term development. It described the G20's agenda as going beyond aid, not replacing aid. So this is the kind of rubbish they hand out for the, the general cattle down at the bottom there, right? Other non-governmental agencies reacted more cautiously. So here's your NGOs. Rich countries must not use the economic crisis or the G20's focus on growth to wiggle out of their commitments to the world's poorest at a time when they need to help more than ever, said Takumo Yamada with Oxfam, the British private aid agency that works with all these guys. So they always bring them out to say commitments. Well, who put commitments? Did, did any person that you know sign a commitment to help uh, the third world across the world? Anybody at all? Hmm? That's why you vote these idiots in, because you're giving them the right to vote at these international agreements on, on them. And without your, you know, you're giving them consent to do it on your behalf. I hope you realize that. Anyway, that's the reality of the world, all rushing ahead. But if you'll notice too, there's very little news about presidents and prime ministers right now. Because you're getting trained into a new system gradually. They're keeping the, the big boys out the limelights. And all all you'll get is reports like this one, where they happen to be attending and stuff like that. Because the days of throwing the rotten tomatoes at them is is going to be over. You're now under authoritarianism and petty bureaucrats and non-governmental organizations. And uh, the the foundations will be dishing out your news to you. That's like the new Soviet. Soviet was ruled by councils. These are all councils, you understand. You don't vote them in. Now there's... Clint from Ontario, if you're still hanging on the line there. Are you there, Clint? Yes, I am, Alan. Uh, yes, thanks go for ahead. taking my call. Mm-hmm. I, uh, I have some questions for you, uh, and I think you'd be the guy to, to answer them. Um, it has uh, something to do with the banks, <clears throat> but uh, there's a free man movement going on, and I'm sure you, you know about it, mm-hmm. and they preach that uh, all our names are in capital letters yeah, on our birth certificates. Yeah, and that, that means that we're a corporation. Now, can you say anything to that at all? Or? Well, technically it's true. You'll notice that every government's letter addressed to you is all in block capitals. And even at school, I can remember getting taught, that whenever it came to examinations and stuff, they'd tell you to write your name in block capitals uh, without telling you why. But uh, I realized afterwards we're blockheads because it's, it is technically a... It is legalities, you know, it's all, but the thing is though, I don't care what you join, if these guys want you, they'll get you. No, I, I understand that, yeah, yeah. I've seen so many folk join these groups over many years, other ones that went before them, there's been lots, a whole succession of them, and the guys often go on tour and they give big speeches, make a lot of money, and then they either get put in prison or they die away, or one of their followers gets put in prison, and, and that's the end of it. But, um, but really, um, you cannot become a lawyer to fight the law. You understand? It would take you years and years to understand all the nitty gritty stuff. And even then, if they want you inside and out the way, they'll get you inside. On the, the laws, there's always two outcomes for any particular type of case. There's always it for the same scenario, the exact same scenario, regardless of what it is. So if, say for a particular crime, if they want you inside, they go and say, okay, a precedent was set by so-and-so on the, on the year so-and-so, so-and-so versus so-and-so, and, and the, the verdict was guilty. If they want to let you go, they'll go and find someone that they let off with that's a precedent set in case, and they let you go. If you've got the right credentials, qualifications, and you know how to wink and stand, and that's how it's really done. 
That's how they operate. In court. I, I think there's no way of getting away from it. <laughs> but I, when I was looking into that, I noticed on, on my birth certificate from Ontario here, um, on the outside of the fine uh, of the border, on the bottom in very fine print, it says Canadian banknote. Mm-hmm. Now, I found that really disturbing to, that uh, a banknote would be on my birth certificate. Not really, because you see, your birth certificate is the first part of identification for the social insurance number. Okay. And the social insurance system was brought in to pay off bank debts, apparently. That's why they first brought in the income tax. Supposedly, it was a temporary war tax, and they kept it on in all the British Commonwealth countries. And that's why you're collateral for all the debt, yeah. I was just going to say that, so that we're tied into the bank somehow then. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, okay. Now, another thing is, now, with the King James Version Bible, Mm -hmm. um, the new one, New and Old Testament, um, when when I was a kid here in Ontario, we would have to recite the Lord's Prayer every morning. Mm -hmm. And uh, it would go on, you know, it would say, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And then in school, we would say, Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those that trespass against us. Mm-hmm. Now, in the King James Version here, it says, And forgive us our debt, as we yeah. forgive our debtors. That's right. Now, now, is that, is that more or less saying that, like, to take on debt, it's, it's illegal in, in what would be God's eyes? You it, know, it, or? It has a different st- uh, meaning in Hebrew, Old Hebrew. Um, because every so many years, the Hebrews had to forgo the debt, but only of their own people. Okay. Um, every th- it was seven years, I think, every seven years, they had to forgive every debt that was outstanding from, from those who owed them money. And so that was tucked in there in that, in a sense, too. Um, but yeah, you're quite right. So it, it was, you see two different versions of that particular phrase right there. Yeah. And, and it's, it's, it's funny that because we were indoctrinated, more or less, to, to say trespasses. And, yeah. and to leave the debt out is because uh, uh, when I looked in the dictionary, trespass more or less means sin. Yeah, that's right. Uh, it's, so uh, forgive us. That's our right. Sin. So people sin against people. Yeah, that makes more sense, really. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I thought I thought that was funny. Mm-hmm. Anyways, uh, yeah. Thanks for clearing that up. And I just want to say uh, I finished your book there, and um, I, I highly recommend it to all your listeners who don't have it, and uh, they should literally get it and read it because you really break things down really good. It wakes you up. It does wake you up to what you see every day, and it doesn't really click with us until you start thinking about it. <laughs> it's, it's all out there, yeah. yeah. And anybody who's on this path to truth and, and want to know, and then, like, you really help it out quite a bit. Okay, Alan, thank you for taking my call. Thanks for calling. But yeah, you you find that everything has changed, and of course, there's been so many um, variations of the New Testament, especially in the last 50 or even longer years. And every change in, in biblical or holy books is done for political reasons. I mean, anyone wanted to go to Sodom and Gomorrah. didn't happen in the Old Testament. It's just a non-event. didn't happen uh, because it was politically incorrect for today. And various things like men lying with men, women with women was a sin. Oh, that's kind of gone in a lot of the newer ones too because they can't have any disharmony and disunity in this big happy utopia in which we live. And speaking of that, by the way, it's interesting that Amazon has got another book out there, uh, and it says Amazon book protested in 2002 for advocating adult child sex is still available on the site. And it says Amazon is selling a self-published book defending pedophiles, sparking discussions about the retailer's obligation to vet items before they're sold in its online stores and threats of boycott from Amazon customers if the book is not removed. The book is called The Pedophile's Guide to Love and Pleasure. There you go. A Child Lover's Code of Conduct. See? So these, these, you know, drooling, predatory pedophiles, they call it love. Eh? These obsessed characters call it love. But this is out there for the folk now. And of course we'll probably say now that we've lost every other, um, level of, of, of morality. And there was, there were levels of morality too, there's no doubt about it. That's how cultures did survive, that a common morality. But it's now moral relativism, and you could basically, any kind of, um, sex or, or enjoyment is supposedly a, a choice, you know, and, and all that kind of stuff. So that's, they're going all the way now, the, the child, uh, pedophile. That's going all the way like all the rest of them went, and there's not much to stop them now, you see. 
not much to stop it. In fact, they even talked at the International Censors Committee meeting in 2001, just before the towers went down. There was time to push the envelope even further. The public were ready for the next step. And that's why you've got all these different uh, comedies out there, supposedly, on particular proclivities towards sexual relations. And you have to get a lot more of them, too. And you thought that censorship committees were there to guard you. Like everything in this world, it's the opposite, folks. It's the opposite. So now it says, um, the author's description, um, including the misspellings it says here, reads, This is my attempt to make pedophile situations safer for those juveniles that find themselves involved in them by establishing certain, he calls certain rules for these adults to follow. I hope to achieve this by appealing to the better nature of pedosexuals, with hope that their doing so will result in less hatred and perhaps lighter sentences should they ever be caught. So there you go, you know, there you go. Amazon issued a statement that will no doubt fuel the outrage comments multiplying on the Pedophiles Guide Amazon page. They've got a whole page, eh? Well, Amazon believes it is censorship not to sell certain books simply because we or others believe that its message is objectionable. It reads, So Amazon does not support or promote hatred or criminal acts. However, we do support the right of every individual to make their own purchasing decisions. How about all the coming victims of these pervs? Huh? Who's going to stand up for their rights so that these, these, these predators can have their way? I've already gone through all that rubbish put out by Kinsey and what a weirdo he was. A guy who used fake data, fake statistics and used prostitutes to pretend these were the average women in, in the world and that became the Bible for every judge across the land to follow. Changed society completely. It was all BS bothersome stuff. That's what it was. That's what he was turning out. And who was funding him? The Rockefeller Foundation. The guys that swore to change American culture. No kidding. And I've gone through the video links for you all to watch from a very good uh, uh, follower, a historian of this particular character. And she's exposed an awful lot of the lies and the fact that Kinsey's, he hired these pervs, you know, these child lovers to have sex with babies. Babies. The stopwatches to time them. These are the creatures who are getting funded by Rockefeller Foundation. One of the biggest foundations pushing your globalistic society and help to destroy the culture totally of the Americas. Still going strong. Working for with the same guys like the G20s and all these guys and all these other foundations. You don't know what you were. Most folk have no idea what they're up against. The co- the, the, it's a coordinated effort with all these organizations which are really part of one big organization that bypass governments. Now they even use governments. Governments today are their lackeys. Back with more after this break. Hi folks, we're back for the last part of cutting through the matrix and we're getting handouts all the time from the media. As I say, the days of any pretense of politicians serving the public is long gone. We just get handouts and PR blurbs and stuff like that. And sometimes, like Britain, and I've read many on the air, they even release them in advance of what a prime minister will say, will say when he meets it with so-and-so next week or whatever. That should give you the whole speech in advance. Personally, I think we should just do away with the guys at the top and, and give Oscars to the, the script writers and give them, you know, story writing uh, um, cups or something to take home with them for being the best scriptwriter, and it would save us money at the same time. But when they make up stories too, they're non-events basically. Here's one here: Prime Minister Stephen Harper of Canada says he's prepared to suffer any political backlash that comes his way for speaking out against anti-Israel rhetoric. And he goes on to say here. He told an audience that while Israel is receptive to fair criticism, Canada is obligated to stand up for its ally when it comes under attack from others. But then he goes and equates the criticism of Israel with anti-Semitism. How, how does he get that? So how does he put the two together? How can you criticize every other country or what it does or doesn't do? But you can't uh, criticize this one or your anti-Semitism. That's rubbish. But then, then it, you, you scroll down to see where he's speaking, and it's a PR job, because I didn't see any massive demonstrations in Canada uh, shouting out about Israel or, or, or being anti-Semitic. So what, is, what it is, it says, 
uh, Harper made his remarks at the start of a two-day conference on anti-Semitism that's been held on Parliament Hill during Holocaust Education Week. This is after his caucus meeting Monday. Ignatius, that's another guy, criticized Harper for suggesting that Canada's recent failure to secure a seat at the United Nations Security Council can be blamed on the federal government's support for Israel. And so... This is what they're trying to make, it's a story of nothing. I can remember when, I think it was Prime Minister Martin went over to Israel when he came back from the United Nations where he worked for six months. That's the only leave he left from politics was six months in the UN and back in to be the Prime Minister. Unelected, in fact, he just took over from Tretian. And the CBC showed a little, a little two-minute blurb uh, from Israel, and there's Martin talking to the, the Israeli Prime Minister, and the Israeli Prime Minister that had asked Canada to take the remaining Palestinians en masse over to Canada. And they wanted Canadians to pay for it too. Yeah. Well, yes, who's better for you? And I'll tell you that, uh, anyway, nothing's much is happening in Canada. So here's a PR blurb handed out here as he's pretending to, to stand up for something that's not even happening. And Canada's the most laid back country there is. It's too late, but it doesn't complain about much at all. It doesn't complain about the prices going up. It doesn't complain about the price of gas going up, taxes going up. They're quite happy, it seems, most of them. And um, no doubt something's happened to them. They used to complain about lots of stuff, but not anymore. I think they're, they're probably a model state like China for the New World Order. Something's been happening to them. Mind you, Canada was the test uh, population that was to be tested with GMO food for 10 years in secrecy. According to what the government released, they made a secret agreement with Monsanto that they would test it on Canadians. And Canadians had it flooded on their food market, didn't know what they were eating, weren't told, until it broke out from Britain. And of course, I'm sure they did all the test studies to see if we were dying faster now and had cancers and were more stupid than all the rest of it. That's the reality of transparent and more clarity in government for the people. Anyway, from Hamish and myself from Ontario, Canada, it's good night to me, your God, or your God's go with you.